Babylon apostasy and the second temple in 530 AD foreshadow denominational apostasy and the second age of Christianity. Second Thessalonians 2, 3 through 11. In denominationalism, men could not understand that the king, the preacher, the faith system, and the Bible from God are as high as the heavens above the religions, preaching, and Bibles of men, Isaiah 55. We could not understand that the subjective truth from men is the cause of human suffering, while objective truth from God is exceeding abundantly greater than we could have imagined, Ephesians 3, 20. By the grace of God, righteous denominationalists will realize salvation even after they are dead in the second age of the kingdom of heaven. Apostasy is ending. Satan is revealed as being the man of sin. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. And that is the second revelation behind the first, which is that Christ is the only qualified preacher in Christianity. Now, these objective truths and others will be poured out upon humanity for the next 40 years while Christian spiritual warfare is going on and we prepare for the second age of the kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 12 and Micah 7, verse 15. Humanity was forced to be under the subjective truth of men for 6,000 years after Adam and Eve chose the subjective truth of men over the objective truth from God. Genesis 2, 17. But for 1,000 years, the Lord will rule over this earth as he does in heaven. That 1,000-year reign was broken up into two ages by denominational apostasy. The Lord will overlook our sin of ignorance in denominationalism as we have no choice, but he demands that we repent for the second age of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Acts 17, 30. Ephesians 2 and verse 7. Righteous denominationalists have been given a strong delusion, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11. And so they're ignorant about the glory, majesty, and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is so that denominationalism can exist. Denominationalist preachers who are righteous, their jobs are to do the best they can do in denominationalism thus illustrating that even good men with the doctrine of men cannot save. And the subjective truth of men is the cause of human suffering, Genesis 2, 17. So righteous denominationalists cannot distinguish between the objective truth from God and the subjective truth of men. They cannot comprehend the Sermon on the Mount, parables, visions, revelation, etc., much less preach it. For example, denominationalists cannot and will not preach to others to be poor in spirit and to stop preaching, Matthew 5, verse 1. Or they cannot preach for people to stop being respecters of persons by elevating themselves between Christ and man and preaching to men. The Lord now calls upon all men everywhere to come out of denominationalism so that we can now understand the previously hidden will and preaching by the perfect preacher, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Matthew 13, 11, Acts 17, 30, Ephesians 1, 9, Ephesians 5, 17, Revelation 17, and 8. Matthew chapter 1. And this is the genealogy of Jesus. Where did this perfect preacher come from? The book of generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham beget Isaac, and Isaac beget Jacob, and Jacob beget Judah and his brethren, and Judah beget Perez, and Zerah of Tamar, and Perez beget Hezron, and Hezron beget Ram, and Ram beget Abinadab, and Abinadab beget Nashon, and Nashon beget Salmon, and Salmon beget Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz beget Obed of Ruth, and Obed beget Jesse, and Jesse beget David the king. And David begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. And Solomon begat Rehoboam. And Rehoboam begat Abijah. And Abijah begat Asa. And Asa begat Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat begat Joram. And Joram begat Isaiah. And Isaiah begat Jotham. And Jotham begat Ahaz. And Ahaz begat Hezekiah. And Hezekiah begat Manasseh. And Manasseh begat Ammon. 
and Ammon beget Josiah, and Josiah beget Je Jeconiah and his brethren, and the time of the carrying away to Babylon. There it is, that foreshadows our denominational apostasy. And after the carrying away to Babylon, Jeconiah beget Sheltiel, and Sheltiel beget Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel beget Abahud, and Abahud beget Elikim, and Elikim beget Azor, and Azor beget Sadok, and Sadok beget Achim, and Achim beget Elud, and Elud beget Eliezer, and Eliezer beget Methan, and Methan beget Jacob, and Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the carrying away to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the carrying away to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. So there's his genealogy. Now we're going to talk about, let's go back here. What is Matthew about? You know, the preaching of Christ is as high as the heavens above the preaching of men, Isaiah 55. It is exceeding abundantly more powerful than we ever could have imagined, Ephesians 3, 20. Objective truth from God is more than we ever knew it could be. I mean, we're talking about peace on earth. We're talking about a preacher that preaches, that calls us before the foundations of the world. We're talking about meek inheriting the earth. We're talking about men being taught by the perfect preacher to love as he loves their neighbor as ourselves. It's uncomprehendable what we're going to find when we consider the perfect preacher. So if you're going to be a Christian, you were called by the Lord before the foundation of the world. Again, denominationalists couldn't even comprehend that Christ preached that he is the perfect preacher. We must be poor in spirit, Matthew 5, 11, and humble ourselves as little children, Matthew 18, 3 and 4, and start preparing for the second age of the kingdom, where Christ has all authority over matters of morality. Now, in Jerusalem, there were those who followed objective truth from God and those who followed subjective truth from men. Remember, Jesus chose his disciples, the apostles, from men that were waiting for the perfect Messiah. Remember King David, he was a man with faults. The reason he was allowed to be king over Israel is to prepare Israel for the perfect king, the Messiah. And so those were, there were those in Jerusalem that were waiting for the perfect king, objective truth from God. And others were Gnostics. They followed the subjective truth of men. They followed the Septuagint Bible. Remember the Septuagint Bible changed the meaning of words. Elohim, for example, was changed to singular. So that's how they denied Christ. They denied he even existed, much less his power, glory, and majesty. And so we've been following denominational Bibles. And again, God's given to us a strong delusion where we wouldn't understand the power, majesty, and glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So now if you can understand that denominationalism can't save you, that we need a perfect preacher, then you're going to be like those few in Jerusalem that were waiting for the perfect Messiah. How exciting is it to listen to the preaching of the perfect preacher? Because Joseph followed the objective truth from God, he believed he was obligated to put Mary away privately. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. In other words, he believed that you ought to obey all the commands in God's word. If a woman is found to be unclean and was with child, obviously Joseph thought from another man, she was to be put away so she could marry the man who was the father of the child. And Joseph certainly would do this quietly and that he and Mary were not even married. Back to our text now. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, before they were married, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, before they were married, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, to be, being a righteous man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But when he thought on these things, behold, a messenger of the Lord, this is going to be Gabriel, the power of God, this is the Holy Spirit who stands before the throne of God. Consider Luke 1, verse 11 and verse 19. He appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, 
the son of David. Fear not to take unto you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he that shall save his people from their sin. And what is sins? Subjective truth of men, which misses the mark of the objective truth of God. In other words, Jesus is going to bring the truth, objective truth from God. It's going to free men from every wind of doctrine of men. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. His burden and his yoke is light compared to the burdens and yokes of men. Now all this has come to pass that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin will be with child and will bring forth a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which has been interpreted God with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the messenger of the Lord commanded him and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth a son. And he called his name Jesus. Matthew chapter 2. Spiritual warfare was already starting in the first century. The wise men follow a star and Satan, who possesses probably Herod, demon possession here. He's a man, but a dead spirit of an evil man in the body of Herod the king. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men. They had some wisdom from above about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. They were not following after the Septuagint and Bibles of men. They were looking for the Messiah. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we saw a star in the east and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, saying and other demons who were troubled were also possessing men in Jerusalem. He was troubled in all Jerusalem with him, and gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ should be born. Now, this is pre-Christian spiritual warfare. There were other demons. So there were other men besides Herod, that were demon-possessed, that were concerned about their opposition, the king of kings. The saint is described as having ten crowns, so he's in control of other kings, and he literally was in the temple in the first century fighting against Christ in the body's win. That's why Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, because Gnosticism, had taken it over. He inquired of them where the Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written through the prophets, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are in no wise least among the princes of Judah, for out of you will come forth a governor who will be shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod privately called the wise men and learned of them exactly what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search out exactly concerning the young child, and when you found him, bring me word, that I also may come and worship him. And they, having heard the king, went on their way, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, we are, we can be in a limited commission as well. As pre-Christians, we pray for wisdom like Cornelius, and God grants us wisdom from above, and God will pour out truth upon this earth, objective truth from God, perfect law of liberty, for about 40 years until the second age of the kingdom of heaven. But on the limited commission, you remember Jesus sent out the 12, and he also sent out 70 on another occasion. But remember how he told them if people didn't want the truth, they shake the dust off their feet and leave. I believe that on the limited commission, when we tell people about Christ, we don't want to push it. We don't have to convince people of the gospel. We just have to offer people the truth. If they don't want the truth or they're not ready for the truth, we don't want it in the enemy's hands. Now back to our text. 
And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And they came into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And opening their treasure, they offered unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in the dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. So spiritual warfare between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of men had already begun early in the life of Christ. Now when they were departed, behold the messenger of the Lord. Now when they were departed, behold the messenger of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be you there until I tell you, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And he arose and took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt did I call my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the male children that were in Bethlehem and in all the borders thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had exactly learned of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she would not be comforted because they were not. Subjective truth of men is the cause of human suffering. God allowed human suffering so that we would be looking forward to a perfect Savior, and a perfect Bible. Now, it's interesting that denominationalism, of course, is a part of Gnosticism and, and part of the human suffering. Now, fast forward it to today, and, and we find the Catholic Church, which they've always taught that children are born in sin so that they could control and manipulate children. And turns out now that the Pope is involved in human trafficking, the murder of children, and drinking of the blood, and eating their flesh. This may be why Jesus talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and maybe a contrast between evil men devouring children and the blood, and uh, us Christ offering his sacrifice that will free us from every wind of the doctrine of men. But when Herod was dead, behold, the messenger of the Lord Again, this is Holy Spirit appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead that sought the young child's life. Now notice here how Christ was taken care of. These wise men came and they provided funds where they could escape. And so the life of Christ could be preserved. Of course, men never would have been able to take the life of Christ except God allowed it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 6 and 7. In their ignorance, they crucified Christ and were allowed to do so. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the room of, this, in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. And being warned of the Holy Spirit in a dream, he withdrew into the parts of Galilee and came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prophets, that he should be called a Nazarene. So if you'll notice, God is in complete control. Matthew chapter 3. This perfect preacher and God, the Godhead 3, were in perfect control of this situation. Now, the Bible and the world and the USA will re reboot. But Jesus was immersed in water by John, and the Holy Spirit was involved. That's what's going to happen to us when Christianity is reborn. We do not have the Bible from God. We've got the denominational Bible. When Christianity reboots. It's because we're going to have the perfect law of liberty. Only the Spirit knows the mind of God. Only Christ is the perfect preacher. The Holy Spirit records this for us in the perfect law of liberty. There's no salvation in the doctrines and Bibles of men. And in those days came John, the one who immersed, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent you, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
For this is he that was spoken of through Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make you ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John himself had his raiment of camel hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then went out unto him Jerusalem and all Judea, and the entire region round about the Jordan, and they were immersed of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the heresies of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his immersion, he said unto them, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruit worthy of repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And even now the axe lies at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed immerse you with water unto repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to wear. He will immerse you with the Holy Spirit, with righteousness, salvation. The gift of the Holy Spirit is salvation. And with fire, damnation for the unrighteous. Christ, he will immerse you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the garner. But the shaft he will burn up with unquenchable fire. Then came Jesus from Galilee to the Jordan and to John to be immersed of him. But John would have hindered him, saying, I need to be immersed by you, and you came to me. But Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was immersed, went up straightway from the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And lo, a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased you think the perfect preacher is qualified to preach? This is proof of who Jesus is. You know, that proof has been hidden away from us for 1,608 years. I mean, we can understand that God exists, but we have not seen his power and his glory and his majesty until we realize that he's kept truth away from us. He's powerful enough to keep, to hide his face from humanity. And to keep us even from even thinking about the objective truth of God for 1,680 years. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew chapter 4. And then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he afterward hungered. And the tempter came and said unto him, If you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, it is written, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We're talking about the objective truth from God, not denominationalism. Spiritually speaking, the second age of the kingdom of heaven will be like returning to the Garden of Eden, where Christ was there with Adam and Eve every day. Objective truth from God every day. And where God will bless us and protect us exceedingly with truth. We'll have all spiritual blessings in Christ, in the kingdom of heaven. Then the devil took him to the holy city and he set him on a pinnacle in the temple. You know, Satan was given some supernatural abilities so that he could tempt Christ. As we see here in this context. Again, he was probably possessing the body of the king, but yet he was able to, I don't know, fly Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you're God's son, cast yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his messengers charge concerning you. And their hands, they shall bear you up, lest happily you dash your foot against the stone. This is the Godhead. The Father and the Holy Spirit are going to take care of the Son. And by the way, that's exactly what happened when Jesus was crucified and he rose on the third day. There was 
the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said unto him, again, it is written, you will not make trial of the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, get you hence, Satan, for it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. We'll bow our knees to Christ only in the kingdom of heaven. Christ will be sanctified and he will be the only one glorified in the kingdom of heaven. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. And when he heard that John was delivered up, he withdrew into Galilee. Then the devil left him, and behold, messengers came and ministered to him. Then the devil left him, and behold, the messengers. Then the devil left him, and behold, the messengers, that's the Father and the Holy Spirit, came and ministered unto him. Now when he heard that John was delivered up, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, toward the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people that sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them that sat in the region and shadow of death, to them did light spring up. From that time began Jesus to preach. There it is. Perfect preacher. You're not going to top it. You're going to disrespect him if you even preach now that you have the perfect law of liberty. Be blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. From that time began Jesus to preach and to say, Repent you for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know what Jesus is preaching now by implication from this passage and all of God's word? Repent. The time of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17 30. Why? For the second age of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As powerfully persuasive as Christ was, he always preached without revealing too much because he poured out truth upon this world slowly so that evil men could stand up against him. If Christ had given us objective truth, there never would have been denominational. It had been completely crushed. The kingdom of heaven is going to consume and destroy every evil kingdom of men. Not going to have a chance. And so God distributed objective truth out slowly. The last portion of it for 40 years until the Bible was completed in 70 AD. And walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brethren, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, cast in a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said unto them, Come you after me, and I will make you fishermen of men. Now, Jesus knew this. The perfect preacher knew this before the foundation of the world, that these men would choose the right path, that they were following the Hebrew Bible and not Gnosticism. They were waiting for the Messiah. And they straightway left the nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they straightway left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. What was he teaching? The gospel of the kingdom. How do I know that? Because it says, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And healing all manner of diseases. And all manner of sickness among the people. And the report of him went forth into all Syria. And they brought unto him all that were sick. Now notice here, only Christ preaches the gospel of the kingdom. Now, the exception may be the Holy Spirit. I think the double-edged sword that's wielded is one side Christ and one side the Holy Spirit. But only the gospel of the kingdom comes from the preacher 
Jesus Christ. He's the only one that could teach the preach of the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of disease and all manner of sickness among the people. And the report of him went forth into all Syria. And they brought unto him all that were sick, suffering with different diseases and torments, possessed with demons and epileptic and palsied. And he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. For the past 1,680 years, humanity has been in denominational apostasy. Now, the word apostasy is found in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. It is the Greek word. Denominationalism is apostasy. It denies the authority of Christ to be the perfect creature in the kingdom of heaven. Consider with me, if you will, that uh, Christ is the perfect preacher. He has all authority. But denominationalism takes that and gives it, gives it to men, the authority to preach. When men cannot know the mind of God, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, they take that authority away from Christ. It's anti-Christ. So we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount today, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And we're going to look at it, giving Christ back his authority and his power and taking his words very seriously. And so for the first time in 1680 years, the Lord is going to be preaching. And we're going to be reading about him preaching the Sermon on the Mount to those who were called before the foundation of the world to be Christians. There weren't Christians yet, but at least some of these he was preaching to were going to be Christians. And the perfect preaching from Christ must be heard. We must grant to him all authority, recognize his power, his authority, and his majesty. Remember the voice from out of heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear you him. And it's Jesus that said, take my yoke upon you. His yoke and his burden were lighter and easier to bear than the yokes and burdens. And having to hear the preaching of the subjective truth of men. Let God be true and every man a liar. Romans chapter 3 and verse 4. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain. And when he had sat down, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. Okay. His preaching counts, not men's. Saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, you can't be a preacher of men if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, men could have never preached the Sermon on the Mount because they would be preaching against their own perceived right to preach. No, blessed are the poor in spirit. You want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to quit being a preacher among men. It's sin. Of course, it's a sin that's not held to our account because the times of ignorance got overlooked. Acts 17, verse 30, because we had no choice. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. We've got to quit preaching. Give Christ back his authority. Humble ourselves as little children, Matthew 18, 3 and 4. Blessed are they that mourn. You're going to cry when you realize the authority of the preacher and the peace that passes understanding that he will give to you. Blessed are they that mourn. When you realize the freedom that the perfect preacher offers, you're going to mourn. For they will be comforted. You know, all spiritual blessings are in Christ and in the kingdom. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. That's about the kingdom. All spiritual blessings in Christ come in the kingdom. And that's going to be in about 40 years because the perfect preacher has all authority. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. 
We're going to fill our hearts and our minds with the perfect law of liberty as we prepare for the second age of the kingdom of heaven. Symbolically, it's going to be like returning back to the Garden of Eden, where God gives us truth. He tells us what to do, and we listen instead of turning away from him and following the subjective food of men, Genesis 2, 17. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. The weapon we wield is going to be the sword of the Spirit, not subjective truth of men, denominational Bibles, but the sword of the Spirit, perfect law of liberty, that frees us from every wind of the doctrine of men. The sword of the Spirit is for the benefit of all humanity. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We're going to love one another with the right motives and with the love of God because we will love God with all of our hearts, soul, and strength. We're going to understand the love of God, agape love. We couldn't understand that in Gnosticism. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Our God is jealous God, jealous of his name. Denominationalism was never Christianity, though the Lord is long-suffering, not willing for any of his creation to perish. And now, once again, we can wield the rod of iron that will in about 40 years bring world peace for the second age of the kingdom. Blessed are they that have been persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Christians will be persecuted for the same reason Christ was murdered, for teaching that he's the perfect preacher, that his preaching is high as the heavens above the Gnostic preaching of men. John 11, 48. Blessed are you when men will reproach you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Evil men out of desperation are doing, are right now doing everything they possibly can to stop objective truth from God from being poured out upon this modern world. Once again, again, John 11, verse 48. Rejoice, the preacher said, and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. Were killed in Christian spiritual warfare. On the Lord's side, it's going to be the best thing ever. The preacher continues, you are the salt of the earth. We're chosen before the foundation of the world. But if salt loses its savor, if you give up before the battle is won, it's going to do you no good. Wherewith will it be salted? If we've lost our Savior, if men preach, if we go back into denominationalism, how's, how's, how are we going to offer salvation to the world? We can't. All we have is good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. The billions of Christians who were called before the foundations of the world, we were predestined, meaning the Lord knew who would follow after him and reflect his light. A city set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under the bushel, but they put it on the stand and it shines into all that are in the house. Even so, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father. Who is in heaven? The end of man is going to be better than the beginning. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8. Christ continues. The preacher speaks to us today. Those of us who have been called before the foundation of the world. Think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will in no wise pass away from the law till all things be accomplished. Jesus is the accomplishment of the Old Testament. We're going to be able to understand the whole Bible now because the whole Bible, the perfect law of liberty, is about the kingdom of heaven. That's why many people in the world today are reading scripture and saying that makes sense because the second age of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what it all was written about. Whoever therefore will break one of these least commandments and will teach men so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. 
So it seems, of course, that there will be sin in the kingdom of heaven. Sin is missing the mark of the objective truth of God. But sin will be looked down upon in the kingdom until it's resolved. We're going to have to add to our faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, temperance, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, patience, godliness, godliness, brother, love, brother, love, and love, so that we'll be ready for the second age of the kingdom of heaven. But whoever will do and teach them, that's in the kingdom of heaven, if we overcome, Overcome the preaching of men, respect the person. If we overcome and recognize that Christ has all authority in heaven and earth, we sanctify the word of God, we'll be called great by God in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that unless your righteousness will exceed the righteousness, evil scribes and Pharisees and Gnostics, Again, we had no choice but to be in denominationalism and Gnosticism, the subjective truth of men. But unless our righteousness now exceeds the righteousness of those who teach the subjective truth of men, we're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to them of old time, Gnostic leaders, people... In the past, again, men were, were under Gnosticism. Men were in the subject of truth of men for 6,000 years. And so what was the problem with the Old Testament? Moses, he wasn't perfect, like the perfect preacher. You've heard it was said of them of old time, you will not murder. Okay, Mo we have that through the law of Moses, and it's delivered to us by murder. What was wrong with it? Well, it's what was wrong is it delivered by Moses. But at any rate, we're told them not to murder, and whoever will murder will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, here's the, the authority now that everyone who is angry with his brother will be in danger of judgment. Okay, it matters what Christ says, what the perfect preacher says. It doesn't matter what men preach. And whoever will say to his brother, Raka, will be in danger of the council. And whoever will say, you fool, will be in danger of the hell fire. If, therefore, you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has anything against you, leave there your gift before the altar. In other words, the kingdom of heaven. We are going to have to deal with our sins. We are in Christian warfare. We will be in Christian warfare. We will have to resolve these issues before the kingdom comes. Because in the kingdom, we'll be freed from every wind of doctrine of men. But, but if we're not ready for the kingdom, we're going to be like those five foolish virgins. They didn't make it. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're with him in the way. Lest happily the adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and you be cast into prison. Verily I say unto you, you will by no means come out hence till you have paid the last farley. You know, Gnosticism is worse than it's ever been. Look at the world we live in. We're going to have to deal with issues in this world. We're going to have to deal with people and issues. And we're going to have to gird up our loins. Scripture tells us that 40 years of warfare before the second age of the kingdom of heaven. Remember Micah 7, verse 15. But we're also warned that things are going to get worse and worse. Spiritual warfare is going to get worse and worse for the next 40 years. I think things are going to straighten. I hope things are going to straighten up quickly, but then gradually for the next 40 years, things are going to wax worse and worse as we approach the second age of the kingdom of heaven. So we're going to have to deal with people the best we can. Again, we're pilgrims. We'll be pilgrims and aliens in this world. Don't pick a side. Don't pick a Gnostic side. 
even if it's capitalism or socialism or atheism or whatever, all the isms of men, forget about it. We're going to be in Christian spiritual warfare for the kingdom of heaven. Remember, the kingdom of heaven is going to break up and consume all the Gnostic kingdoms of men. Daniel 2, verse 44. Gain control over your adulterous thoughts, but more specifically, gain control over your preaching to others. You've heard it was said, you will not commit adultery. Exodus 20, verse 14. Note again, they were they were so reminded by unfaithful leadership. But I say unto you that everyone that looks on a woman that lusts after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. What's he saying? You're the blind leading the blind. You've committed adultery in your heart. You don't have a right to be teaching others or preaching to others about adultery. Only the spirit, only the perfect law of liberty knows the mind of God. We haven't even had the Bible from God. How can you teach what God says about any subject? We've been in Gnosticism. We've been in apostasy. If your right eye causes you to stumble, plug it out and cast it from you. For it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not your whole body be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and cast it from you. For it's profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not your whole body go to hell. What's that mean? Well, if men are going to have beams in their eyes and get specks out of other men's eyes and they're not going to repent it, they're not going to stop doing that. We've got to cast them out of the body. We've got to pluck that eye out. As members of, as, as righteous people serving God, we can't have among us those that are causing harm. Again, we had no choice but to be in Gnosticism. But now that the second age of the kingdom of heaven is at hand, we must deal with these matters. It was said also, whoever shall send away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. That's an that's a interesting statement by Jesus. Denominationalist, Gnostics, again, the world was under Gnosticism for 6,000 years total. We'll only be under Christ's rule over this earth for 1,000 years. But it was said also, who, whoever will send away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that everyone sent, that sends away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, makes her an adulteress. Okay, men got it right, saying you need to give, your, give a writing of divorcement if you send one away. But Jesus says, if you don't do that, you're causing her to commit adultery. In other words, the preaching of men wasn't adequate. We need a perfect preacher. And whoever shall and whosoever shall marry her when she's sent away commits adultery. Okay, if you send a woman away and, she, and she's not divorced and you, somebody else, you're causing her to commit adultery. You know, we perhaps got away with a lot in Gnosticism, but in the kingdom of heaven. We're going to treat our wives right and our husbands right. And we're going to deal with matters of adultery and fornication. We're going to have to deal with those things as we prepare for the second age of the kingdom of heaven as well. Or we're not going to make it. Again, you have heard. Here's what men said. It was said of them of old time, you will not forswear yourself, but will perform unto the Lord your own. But I, here's what God says. Here's what the perfect preacher says. Swear not at all, neither by the heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither will you swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. 
Again, isn't it odd that blasphemers were concerned about other men performing their oaths? He says, but let your speech be yes, yes, no, no. And whatever is more than these is of the evil one. Again, we were forced to be in Gnosticism, a subjective truth of men, but in even the denominational Bibles, they got some things right. With the denominational Bibles, we had yes, yes, no, no, maybe. Depends on who you ask. It's amazing that we believe that we thought that we had God's perfect moral standard. We didn't at all. Morality was all gray. That's why we have the troubles in the world that we have. Subjective truth of men does not work. It's all mixed up. Remember El Paz, Bill, and Zophar, when they mixed up the wisdom of God with the wisdom of men? Remember, they were no help at all to Job. But getting back to the kingdom, we need to speak where the Bible speaks only. And men need to keep their mouth shut. Anything more than that is going to be a problem. Jesus continues, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what men say. Really, I mean, it, God's law, but men delivered it. And men interpret it and kind of spoke it. But I say unto you, do not fight against evil. But whoever smites you on the right hand, turn to him the other also. Okay. Jesus, he was already involved in spiritual warfare. And he's talking about preparing for the kingdom. And so we have 40 years of Christian spiritual warfare before the kingdom. And we're going to have to try to get along the best we can with people in this world. And so someone smites us on the right cheek, turn them the other. If any man will go to law with you and take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. Whoever will compel you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to him that ask you, and from him that would borrow of you, turn not you away. Now, remember, we couldn't preach that before because men can't preach what the, only the perfect preacher can preach. Now he's talking to those of us who will be in the kingdom of heaven, who will be converted. We're called before the foundation of the world. There are going to be Christians. Christianity is going to reboot. And those are who he's speaking to now. In Christian warfare, you've got to gird up your loins and you've got to take care of business because the world's going to be out to kill you. The world's going to hate you for teaching that Christ has all authority. That he's the, he is the preacher of righteousness. So you're going to have to do your best to get along with men. Now, remember, it's just during the warfare time. We're going to be freed from every wind of doctrine men. Men are not in the kingdom of God. When we get there, men are not going to be commanding us to take the burden for a mile. Why? Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. His burden and his yoke are lighter and easier to bear than men's. His preaching is a whole lot easier to listen to than the preaching of men. We won't have to be under the doctrine of men. In the kingdom of heaven. So as we prepare to get there though. We're going to have to struggle. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden. When they gave up objective truth of God. And obeyed subjective truth of men. They were kicked out of the garden. For 6,000 years men had been kicked out of the garden. But for the thousand years. In the kingdom. We're going to be freed from every wind of doctrine. Men, the subjective truth of men. Give to him that ask you, and from him that would borrow of you, turn not you away. Okay? Eve had to be subject to Adam, didn't she, when they were cast out of the garden? It's just the way it worked. Had to be. And, and right now, women, you need to subject yourself to your husbands and husbands to your wives, and certainly in certain ways. We, can, we have to subject ourselves to one another as men. But that's until we get into the second age of the kingdom of heaven. Then it's going to be like we return back to the Garden of Eden where we have Christ with all authority. And, you know, we in this country, we're going to live in a, we're going to live in a democratic republic where Christ makes all the moral decisions and men make the decisions that they can make because Christ is all authority. And you know what? He's going to protect us and bless us exceedingly. 
That's why God's word is like a lamp to our feet. We're talking about the perfect law of liberty. He's going to keep us and protect us, and all spiritual blessings are going to be in the kingdom of heaven. You have heard Jesus speaking, that it was said basically by men. You're going to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, and this we're talking about God. He's going to teach us about the love of God so that we can love our enemies and pray for them that persecute you. We're going to do it in the kingdom of heaven because Christ has all authority. He's the perfect preacher, and we're going to wield the rod of iron. We are going to love our enemies with the love of God, and we're going to pray for them that persecute us because God commands it. And we love the Lord. We will love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind. We're going to do what He says to do because we know it's good for us. We know He's going to protect us. We're not going to have to worry about making decisions over moral issues. We're going to lead lead the best lives men have ever led on this earth. The end of a thing is better than the beginning. Ecclesiastes seven verse eight. That you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them that love you, what rewards have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Remember, we had no choice when we were in Gnosticism. But now that Christ reigns or he's getting ready to reign again we need to learn what it means to follow the perfect law of liberty do not even the publicans the same if you salute your brethren only what do you more than others do not even foreign nations do the same you therefore must be perfect perfect in not preaching perfect in not being respected person perfect in confessing sin. That means saying the same thing about sin that Christ says about sin. Perfect in dealing with our sin as your heavenly father is perfect. We're going to love God if we keep his commandments. We're going to be able to keep his commandments in, with the perfect law of liberty. If you hang on and do the right thing, things are going to get easier, not worse, in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 6, as we prepare to inherit the stewardship of the earth, the meek are going to inherit the earth. There's going to be world peace in the second age of the kingdom of heaven. Take heed that you do not your righteousness before men, to be seen of them, else you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. When therefore you show mercy to the needy, sound not a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have received their reward. Okay, we've got to give up denominational. We've got to be poor in spirit. So we're going to have to do things God's way instead of men's way. And here we start with some more detail in your prayers. Don't pray publicly. I mean, there's a time for public prayer, but you're going to be worshiping God and studying the Bible in your home alone or with your family every day. So that when you gather together to worship with the saints, we'll all have the same doctrine. We'll all believe the same thing. But when you do righteous acts, we don't do it for the world to see. The fact of the matter is, it's not going to be safe the next 40 years to do righteous acts and do it to be seen to men. Because evil men are going to be out to destroy you. So don't sound a trumpet when you help other people, as the hypocrites do. The Gnostics, denominationalists, socialists, atheists, as they do in their Gnostic synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have received their reward. Okay? You know, in denominationalism, we had to advertise our good deeds. So that we could bring people in to our denomination, right? To our group. We had to preach and teach and show how good we were in this world. But Jesus said, they have their reward. Pat yourself on the back, that's your reward. But when you do show mercy, let not your left hand know 
what your right hand does, that you're showing them mercy may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will recompense you. I'm telling you it's denominational apostasy. We've got to come out of that. Acts chapter 17, verse 30, the times of ignorance, God overlooked. We didn't have any choice. He forgives us for what we did in denominationalism. But we've got to come out and start preparing for the second age of the kingdom of heaven. Acts 17, verse 30. Repent. For the second age of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when you pray, you will not be as the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the corners of the street that they may be seen in men. Okay, in the kingdom, and we need to start preparing for the kingdom. Christians now can know how to pray. And he's going to give some instruction here. Follow. We're going to pray in truth according to the spirit. We're going to have the perfect law of liberty, and we're going to learn how to pray. And so we're not going to have to get up there and say, be in thou, because that sounds righteous. Show our righteousness. No, we have no clue in denominations. Verily I say unto you, they have received their reward. Okay? You want to get up there and sound holier than thou? Be in thou, you know, that's your thing. It's okay, that's fine. But you've received your reward. For how good a prayer you are. Men have patted you on the back. But you, when you pray, enter into your inner chamber and having shut your door, pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will recompense you. This is God Almighty speaking to us about prayer. Again, there's a place for public prayer, but our Lord wants us to pray at least once a day in private, or maybe with our families. Shut the door and pray to your Father in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will recompense you. And in praying, use not vain repetitions as the denominationalists do. The Gnostic Gentiles here well, they think that they will be heard for their much speaking. Okay. If you're going to be in a closet anyway, in private anyway, it doesn't make sense to use repetition, does it? And so do it in private, and you're not going to be tempted with this much repetition. And again, you're going to learn how to worship God in spirit according to truth, the perfect law of liberty. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of, before you ask him, we want to pray to God and ask him for blessings. And, I mean, we have our needs, but he says you don't have to list these needs. God knows already. Again, he's going to show us how to pray. We have an example prayer here. After this manner, therefore pray you. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Generally speaking, when you pray and ask for things, it's to God the Father. I might remind you here, there's a difference between prayer and thanksgiving. We generally put these in one category. Notice here that prayer and thanksgiving in this context are to God the Father. Generally speaking, though, when we sing, most of the time it's praise to Christ. And again, we're going to learn that from the Psalms, and we're going to learn how to worship God and truth according to the Spirit with the perfect law of liberty. But our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Okay, are we to pray that Christ's kingdom will come? Yes, the second age of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're past the denominational apostasy is ending. After the apostasy, we go back to first to New Testament Christianity. New Testament Christianity, 40 years of warfare, prepares us for the second age of the kingdom of heaven. And so we pray that the Lord's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Ask God for for the food we eat. Again, this would seem to be once a day, right? At least once a day. Just pray for that God will grant you food. 
and forgive us for doing wrong. Gnosticism, especially. We're coming out of Gnosticism. As we have forgiven our debtors, we need to start forgiving men. And bring us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil. And this is subjective truth of men. For if you forgive men their trespasses, Jesus speaking again, if you forgive men their trespasses, you, Heavenly Father, he continues in his prayer, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. But what my preachers, I don't care what your preachers say. We've been in denominational apostasy. When you pray, pray like Jesus instructed you to pray. He's the perfect preacher. But the preacher said that God will forgive us. We can still not forgive men and God will pray. I don't care what your preacher said. But God doesn't care what your preacher said. Moreover, when you fast, do not be as the Gnostic hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may be seen of men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have received their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that you are not seen of men to fast, but of your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will recompense you. Fasting. A lot of preachers have ideas about what you should do. Fasting in today's modern world, don't they? But I think Jesus Christ, who has all authority and will resume that on earth as he does in heaven, I think he has a right to tell us what to do about fasting. Don't be like denominationalists. Don't be like men. Don't listen to what men have to say. Be of a sad countenance and disfigure your face. And you can be seen to be fasting and, and you'll be an important person how religious you are. Verily I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, know what your head and wash your face, that you're not seen the men to fast. You need to fix your hair, comb your hair, deal with your hair, and wash your face, yes. Don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to look really religious as I read the Bible. If anybody sees me studying, I want them to know that I'm fasting. Do it in secret. Look like you've eaten breakfast as you read and study the Bible. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moss and rust consume and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does consume and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, rich men won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. How come? Because they've stolen from people. Now, in Gnosticism, subject for the men, we had to lay up for ourselves treasures. I mean, we, we needed to take care of ourselves. Didn't. But if we overly took care of ourselves and we're rich, we're not going to make it in the kingdom of heaven unless we repent. But now we need to start investing in the future in the kingdom of heaven and looking forward. Likely in the kingdom of heaven, money won't be the same kind of issue because we're going to love our neighbors. We're going to love our enemies. We're going to love our fellow Christians. We're going to take care of each other. Assume there will be money, but it's going to be a lot different matters. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eyes be single, if we accept only objective truth from God and not subjective truth of men, the whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil and you look to subjective truth of men, that fruit sure looks good, as Eve might have said in the garden. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and men. You know, that's the matrix we were in, and it sure wasn't turning out well, the subjective truth of me. You see, God gave us an opportunity. And why were righteous men in denominationalism? God wanted righteous to do the best they could 
to show that the preaching and the ways of men don't work. Therefore, I say unto you, be not anxious for your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor yet for your body, what you will put on. Is not the life more than food and the body than raiment? Behold, the birds of the heaven, that they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, nor your heavenly Father feed them. Are not you of much more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to the measure of his life? And why are you anxious concerning raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God does so clothe the grass of the field, which is which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Obey God's word, perfect law of liberty, and be exceeding blessed. Obey men, the subject truth of men, the Bibles of men, and risk starving and freezing to death. Be not therefore anxious, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or wherewithal will we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek you first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in a time of affliction. The Christianity, the Lord's Christianity, we are going to take care of each other. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Be not therefore anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Fighting Christian spiritual warfare, we have to take it one day at a time. Matthew chapter 7. Judge not, but you be not judged. For 6,000 years of humanity, we were on the subject of truth of men. And yet we had to be in ignorance. So that we would think subjective truth was... Uh, so we wouldn't realize that it, what subjective truth was. And it's important for us to prove and to show that men making judgments with the Bibles or the religions of men, it doesn't work. Look at the cancel culture we live in today. Where everybody judges everybody based on subjective truth of men. It doesn't work. So the Lord is the righteous judge. He has all authority. He decides what morality is. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. You can judge with subjective truth, it's gonna you're gonna be judged with subjective truth. Again, we were in ignorant about all these things, but now we can identify sin. And now we can know not to judge with subjective truth of men. With what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you meet, it will be measured unto you. And why do you behold the speck that is in your brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in your own eye? We can't preach to men. Why? Because we've got our own problems. We can't judge men. Why? Because we've got our own problems. You're going to judge that speck that's in your brother's eye when you have a beam in your own eye? How will you say to your brother, let me cast out the speck out of your eye and lo, the beam is in your own eye? You see, we need a perfect Savior to judge us. We need a perfect preacher to preach to us. Because none of us cut it. We need a perfect Savior. We need a perfect Bible. You see, men don't know the mind of God. We thought we did. But we were under strong delusion. We didn't even have the perfect law of liberty. The Spirit, Only the Spirit knows the mind of God. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. 
So only through the perfect law of liberty can we understand God's will or his judgments for us. Out of your own eye, and then shall you see clearly to cast out the moat out of your brother's eye. And this gets back to taking care of each other. We can help each other deal with sin. <clears throat> As Christians, we can help each other, and we should deal with sin and help each other deal with sin, but we're using God's perfect moral standard and not our own. We don't determine what is sin, or we don't determine what issues are important enough to deal with. We don't determine those matters. We listen to the perfect preacher. So we can teach what the perfect preacher gives to us. One cannot give that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast your pearls before the swine. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD because of subjective truth of men. Men translated the Bible. They translated the word Elohim in the singular. That's how they denied Christ. Denominational Bibles were the authority behind the crucifixion of Christ. Subjective truth of men doesn't work. So these Gnostic Jews could no longer see to help anyone any longer. Can't give that which is holy unto the dogs. The Lord didn't give the Bible to an apostate world. If he would, it couldn't have remained apostate. The thousand years Christianity would have been used up before the world was populated with billions. Neither cast your pearls before swine. Don't try to force the kingdom upon men. Lest happily they trample them under their feet and turn and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Now, we're going to be given wisdom from above for about 40 years as we prepare for the second age of the kingdom of heaven. We're to study, we're to add to our faith, put on the full armor of God, and we're to ask God for wisdom, James 1, 5. And he will give it to us. According to the days that I come out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto marvelous things. Marvelous things we're going to be receiving. Perfect law of liberty. Objective truth from God that we can't even imagine. We couldn't even imagine while we were in denominationalism. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives. And he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there of you who, if his son will ask him for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he will ask for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? All things, therefore, whatever you would that men should do unto you, even so do you also unto them. For this is the law. And the prophet enter you in by the narrow gate, one faith system from God, rather than the many faith systems of men. For wide is the gate, subjective truth. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are they that enter, and many are they that enter in thereby. For narrow is the gate, and straight is the way that leads into life. And few are they that find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. Now, I suppose this is talking about when we first have opportunity to be obedient to the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, there were few. The mustard seed was small. Groups were small that first believed. But then the kingdom will grow into a great tree. It will be the only religion in the world. I believe that billions will be Christians in the second age of the kingdom of heaven. By their fruits, you will know them. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit. But the corrupt Gnostic tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. 
So an agnostic Bible, a Bible for men, can't bring good fruit. And the Bible for God can't bring denominationalism either. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. The Battle of Armageddon will be the last Gnostic standing and destroyed. Foreshadowed by Babylon Rome in Revelation 17 and 8. Therefore, by the fruits you will know them. We're going to identify the kingdom of God versus the religions of men. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody's going to give up denominationalism. But he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy by your name and by your name cast out demons? Weren't we Christians? And by your name do many wonderful works. Then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. He doesn't share his name with denominationalism. Ezekiel 39, 25. Even though there are righteous believers in denominationalism. We're talking about evil here. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Everyone, therefore, that hears these words of mine and does them will be likened to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended. And the flood came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these words of mine, you know, if your religion is based upon objective truth from God, it's going to come through at the end, right? Bring salvation. But socialism, denominationalism, atheism, all the isms of men are not going to last. It's like building your house on sand. A wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended and floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house it fell not for it was founded upon a rock and everyone that hears these words of mine the words of God rather than the words of men if you hear the words of his word and you keep listening to Gnosticism you do them not it will be. and you don't do them you will be likened to a foolish Everyone that hears these words of mine, the words of Christ, and ignores them because they're listening to men and does them not, that's the words of Christ, he will be likened to a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and smote upon that house. And it fell and great was the fall thereof. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The multitude were astonished because he taught as having authority. All authority is God. Perfect preacher. And really only his words matter.